upcoming lectures. Amy? All right, well, I'm really happy to introduce our speaker for today. His name is Dr. Tom Shepard. He's a professor of New Testament at Andrews University. Um, as this is an ATS chapter, he is a former president of the Adventist Theological Society, and he still remains very active in um, National Society of Biblical Literature activities. Um, but as just Michael said, he is my dad. And so I'm um, very happy to, I'm delighted to introduce my father. And one of the things I think that's very special about him as a scholar is that he has a very scholarly mind, but he has a very pastoral heart. And so I feel that what he does in scholarly areas is always very practical, and that it's not just about learning things for your mind, but it's about how can I use this to serve other people better? How can I use this to carry forth the work of the Lord? And so I hope that you enjoy his, his discussion today. He, um, he is very passionate about missions. He was a former missionary in, in Malawi, Africa, as well as in Brazil. Passionate about missions, passionate about exercise, passionate about his grandchildren. Um, but we're so happy that he could be here to speak for our chapter today. Good afternoon. It's good to be with you here in uh, Keene. Uh, this morning I had the privilege of uh, baptizing my grandson Isaiah at the uh, Cleburne Church. And uh, Mike, when they knew we were coming down here for Christmas and for uh, baptizing Isaiah, uh, Michael said, oh, would you be willing to give a presentation to the, uh, society, to the Adventist Theological Society? I said, sure. Um, woo, this is a little, a little strong. Um, this paper that I'm going to read to you is uh, a paper that I prepared for the Society of Biblical Literature. Now, what the Society of Biblical Literature is, is a national organization of like 10,000 people come to a location. We were in San Diego a couple weeks ago. Um, I helped to found a number of study groups for the, for the Gospel of Mark. Well, I'm, that's my area of expertise. And so we just had approval, and this was our first year for the Mark Passion Narrative Seminar. Uh, so this is a group of scholars. This is not just Adventist scholars. These are scholars from all walks of life, all, all different organizations and beliefs. And some of them, uh, well, I think probably in our group, it's almost all believers. But you don't always have believers in the uh, SBL. So this is a, this is a technical paper. Uh, what I'm going to do is go through, uh, I have a slide program first. I'm going to walk you through this a little bit uh, to... Uh, help prepare you for the, some of the technical stuff. And if the technical stuff is just, is just too technical, just, just say, okay, I'll, I'll get the main, the main gist. But if you love the technical stuff, amen. You know, that's great. All right, so uh, this was a paper. Uh, the Passion Narrative of Mark is Mark chapter 14, 15, and 16. Okay, Mark 14, 15, 16. The very first two stories is what my paper is about. The first two stories are two stories that are linked together. So let me walk through this. Here's, here's the research question you could ask. How can the execution of an innocent and gracious man be good news? See, the subtitle of my paper, The Irony of Two Trajectories, How the Enemies of Jesus Help Preach the Gospel. And you think about that and you say, the enemies of Jesus, they wouldn't preach the gospel. Right? So how does that work? So here's the research question. How can the execution of an innocent and gracious man be good news? Uh, that's what the gospel is all the time, right, isn't it? I mean, it's the death of Jesus is good news. How can that be? How can it be good if he's innocent and gracious and they executed him without cause? All right, so here's an extract, a little extract from my, my paper that gives you the thesis. So this is my big point, all right? If you get the big point, the other stuff can fall into place. My thesis is that the trajectories set within these two stories, this is a story of, oh wait, I should, I should tell you the two stories, right? So what I did was, um, when I was at, at these meetings, I memorized the verses, Mark chapter 14, 1 to 11, I memorized them. So let me see if I can recite them, it was a couple weeks ago, and I'll see if I can do a good job for you, all right? Now the Passover, and the Feast of Unleavened Bread were after two days. And the chief priests and the scribes were looking for a cunning way to arrest him and kill him. For they were saying, not at the feast, lest there be a riot of the people. And while he was in Bethany in the house of Simon the leper, as he was reclining at table, a woman came 
with an alabaster flask of perfume made of pure nard, very expensive. She broke the alabaster flask and poured it over his head. And some people there were indignant among themselves. Why has this perfume been wasted? For this perfume could have been sold for more than 300 denarii and given to the poor. And they kept on attacking her. But Jesus said, leave her alone. Why are you causing her trouble? She has done a good work for me. For you always have the poor with you, and whenever you want, you can do good for them. But you do not always have me. She made use of what she had. She came beforehand to anoint my body for burial, and I tell you the truth. Wherever the gospel is preached in the whole world, what she has done will also be told in memory of her. And Judas Iscariot, one of the twelve, went away to the high priest to betray him to them. And when they heard this, they rejoiced and promised to give him money. And he started looking for a good opportunity to betray him. Now, that's Mark chapter 14, verses 1 to 11. Okay, so here's the thesis of my paper. My thesis is that the trajectory set within these two stories, the story of the priests and Judas trying to, you know, set up a betrayal of Jesus and the woman anointing Jesus, that two stories, one ending in the silence of death, that's the story of the priests and Judas, the other extending outward in gospel proclamation, that's the woman's story, work together to express the overarching thesis of the Mark Passion narrative, that what appears to be an incredible tragedy, the crucifixion of Jesus, is in reality the best news the world has ever experienced. This, I maintain, is the most profound irony within the Gospel of Mark. Okay, so that, that's the thesis of my paper. Now, I have to explain a little bit to you about how I produce the paper. I use something called narrative analysis. This is where you study a story's plot, its characters, its settings, its actions, its time relationships, the author, the reader, the stylistic features, and you, if you say, that sounds like an awful lot of stuff, my students would agree with you. Because if you, take a, a, if you take a story like I just recited to you, 11 verses, and what we do is we take and we put all this into spreadsheets, all these different characteristics, probably takes about 20 pages. You know, well, I suppose if you put it in spreadsheets, it's about seven different spreadsheets, but that's a lot of data, a lot of data. They work hard at this. So this story, the story of the high priests and the scribes and Judas plotting to get Jesus killed, and the story of the woman who anoints Jesus is what's called a sandwich story. Uh, these appear at least six times, these kind of story appears at least six times in the Gospel of Mark. Um, this, was the, this was what I did my dissertation on years ago. One story begins, the other story interrupts it with the outer story completed after the, the inner story is, com is, is completed, it, that interrupted it is completed. So you see it's like a sandwich. You have this one story and then a story comes and interrupts it, breaks in between it, right? Okay. Now, what I discovered in my, in my dissertation work was that the, this storytelling device in the Gospel of Mark is all about irony, all right? Now, people don't always understand irony, so I give an explanation of what irony is. Irony has three characteristics. There are two different levels, all right? The two levels are in conflict or contrast with one another, and somebody doesn't get it. All right, so let me, let me give a simple example. Let's say it was raining cats and dogs, and it was 35 degrees outside, kind of sleety, you know, it was just a yucky day, overcast, and that never happens here in Keene, right? That's, uh, that's what happens in Berrien Springs. We get lots of that. Okay. So it's just like an ugly day outside, and I came whistling into class, and I said, oh, what a beautiful day it is outside. Okay? Now, you, you might smile if you were on the cheerful side. You might smile and say, oh, I get it. He's, he's sort of telling a joke. You know, we know that it's a terrible day outside, but uh, he's making the best of it, right? Now, if we had a small child, see, children, little children, little children, do not have a sense of irony. See, they don't, they don't recognize that. And they might look at me and say, it's not nice outside. It's, it's yucky outside, you know, something like that. 
That's irony. Okay, so there's two levels. They're in contrast with one another. And usually there's somebody that doesn't get it. Now, that's what happens in these sandwich stories, and the paper will explain more of that. The other thing I have to tell you about is that in any story, there are two kinds of time. There's what's called story time. That's the historical time in the story itself. And there's just what's called discourse time. Discourse time is the telling of the story, the order in which it's told, how often it's told, how long you take to tell it, uh, of the events in the story. So, for instance, I could say in a, a story, and a thousand years passed. Well, that was one sentence, but it was a thousand years, wasn't it? But I covered a thousand years in one sentence. Or I might take one second, and I might take ten pages to explain that one second. See? You can tell stories in many different ways. Okay, so that's these two different kinds of time. Now, uh, story time present is another aspect of this. This is all the stuff I go over in class with my students, so you forgive me if it's a, a little boring or confusing. Um, the story time present is the sense of the present where the story is at the present moment. And the way I describe this is you've all watched YouTube videos at so one time or another, right? You've seen a YouTube video. If you look at the YouTube video and you hold your cursor over the YouTube video, you will see at the bottom of the screen a little line, right? And on that little line will be like a little red dot moving from left to right. You don't understand what I'm saying? Right? That dot is story time present. All right? That dot. In other words, wherever you are in the video, that's the present. That's the story time present. Okay? Now... In storytelling, we have what we call an analepsis or a prolepsis, all right? An analepsis is telling an event after the fact. So this refers back to an earlier time during the story time present. A prolepsis is telling events before the fact, a prophecy, you might say, or foretelling of events that will take place. Let me give an example. That helps. Mark 14, verse 4. There were some who said to themselves indignantly, why was the ointment wasted like that? Okay. Now, when did she pour out the ointment. Just before that, it was in verse 3, okay? But now they're talking about an event that has already happened. Why has the ointment been wasted? Of course, notice what they're doing. They're judging her, right? They're saying it was wasted. You know, it wasn't used well. But they're characterizing what she's done, and they're talking about something that already happened. That's what we would call an analepsis. Now, Jesus says, so the woman's action took place in verse 3, the complainers are talking about something that happened in the past. In verse 9, we have Jesus. Truly, I say to you, wherever the gospel is proclaimed in the whole world, what she has done will be told in memory of her. So the woman's action will be told in the future when people preach the gospel. That's what we call a prolepsis. Okay. So I know I've kind of like taught you a lot of stuff here already. All right. Now, the religious leaders plan Jesus' death Jesus speaks not just of his death, but of the gospel going to the whole world, All right? So there's, there's these kind of two trajectories. And in the paper, which we'll read now, uh, we'll say, how can this be good news? And I outline how in the rest of the Mark and Passion narrative in Mark chapter 14 and 15 and 16, the trajectory of the woman's story is, shall we say, the bells are rung, okay? The Last Supper, Jesus' blood seals the new covenant. Gethsemane, God's will to come to pass. At the cross, Jesus is the king. And the resurrection, Jesus' burial is not the end. So the true trajectory is the story of the woman, the one that Jesus foretold. They are trying to kill him, but in the process, the good news goes everywhere. They're trying to stop it, but they can't stop it. All right, you with me? All right, so that, that, that's kind of the, the gist of this paper. Now, I'm going to exit this. I've got to change over here to mirror, mirror, mirror on the wall. Let's see, display. I've got to go to arrangement and mirror it. Okay, now what we're going to do is read the paper, okay? Uh, maybe turn off the lights up in front. Is it possible to do that so that it's a little... Oh, yes, it's wonderful. Can you read? Can you see that well now? All right, back there in the back? Okay, all right, so here's the paper. I have argued elsewhere that the function that was in my dissertation and so forth, I've argued elsewhere that the function of intercalation, that's the sandwich story thing, in the narrative of the Gospel of Mark is to illustrate dramatized irony between major characters of the two intertwined stories. 
The ironies thus displayed present lessons about Christology and or discipleship, often in paradoxical form. A prime example is the sandwiching of the story of the unnamed woman with the hemorrhage with the story of Jairus and his daughter in Mark chapter 5. The two central characters, Jairus and the woman, stand in paradoxical contrast with each other. He's a male, she's a female. He's got a name, she's unnamed. He's a synagogue ruler, she's excluded from religious ceremony because of her flow of blood, and that's just beginning, et cetera, et cetera. And yet, both of these characters come to Jesus for healing. Again, paradoxically, one coming openly in front of Jesus after he saw him, the other coming in secret behind Jesus after hearing about him. Further, the woman's story ends in open before the crowd where she confesses the whole truth, while Jairus' story ends in seclusion with the command not to tell others about the raising of his daughter. The irony of the story is that Jesus heals the chronic case, the woman, first, and the delay over the healing results in the death of the acute case, Jairus' daughter. But this tragedy ends in joy as Jesus raises the dead girl to life. These roller coaster stories demonstrate the power of the Messiah, unlimited by normal barriers of life, triage, and death. Now, the opening scene of the Mark Passion narrative is one of the intercalated stories of the Mark and narrative. It intertwines the story of the religious leader's plot to kill Jesus with the striking story of an unnamed woman who anoints Jesus' head with an extremely expensive perfume. I have argued previously that the irony of this story is built around a play on words linked with the word good, all right? So in 14.6, Jesus says, um, you can always do good for them. No, she has done a good work for me. And then he says, you can always do good for the uh, poor. And then he, he says, uh, what she's done will be good news. And then uh, Judas looks for a good opportunity. If you look at the uh, recitation of what I did, I, I translated the passage to play on that word good with the word good showing up in those places. All right, so, um, so let me read that sentence again. I've argued previously that the irony of this story is built around a play on words linked with the word good and on the value placed on Jesus. The good deed that the woman has done for Jesus, unappreciated and disparaged by the crowd, he exalts as part of the gospel message to be taken throughout the world. But this seems to stand in sharp contrast, even conflict, with the plot against Jesus in the outer story where a good man's death is planned to be carried out in secret. Judas the betrayer looking for the opportune moment to hand over his master. Further, the value the woman places on Jesus by anointing his head, like kings were anointed in the Old Testament, I was uh, challenged on that at the SBL meetings, stands in sharp contrast with the mere promise of money to Judas for his nefarious deed. It is just this type of two levels in conflict that led me to the idea of dramatized irony as the genius of market intercalation. That was kind of, the, kind of the conclusion of my dissertation. Irony consists of three concepts, two levels of meaning, the levels are in conflict, and alizoni, the idea that someone does not catch the ironic conflict in contrast, does not see where things are actually leading. Alizoni is a specialized term. Um, it comes from a Greek term, alizone, who was in Greek plays um, this proud buffoon that you could see, everybody who was watching the play could see that he was going to fall flat on his face. And part of the fun of the play was that he didn't see it coming. You know, he was, he was this pompous guy, and it just made it all the more funny that he was going to fall flat on his face. It's like America's Funniest Home Videos, right? Um, so in the intercalated stories, the two stories serve as the vehicle of the two levels of meaning. Either parallel characters carry out opposite actions or opposite characters carry out parallel actions. Always there is some contrast between the stories and always someone does not see or understand what is happening, the alizone. In the case of Mark 14, 1 to 11, two characters with either the title or actions depicting discipleship, Judas, one of the 12, and the unnamed woman honoring Jesus with her expensive gift, carry out opposite actions. Judas betrays Jesus, the woman honors him as King Messiah. The irony is that Judas and the religious leaders do not see where their actions are really headed. The resurrection of Jesus and the preaching of the gospel throughout the world. My intention for this present paper is to extend this research by describing the trajectories set by these two intercalated stories as they play out throughout the Mark Passion narrative. My thesis is 
that the trajectories set within these two stories, one ending in the silence of death, the other extending outward in gospel proclamation, work together to express the overarching thesis of the Mark Passion narrative that what appears to be an incredible tragedy, the crucifixion of Jesus, is in reality the best news the world has ever experienced. This, I maintain, is the most profound irony within the Gospel of Mark. My method for presenting evidence in support of this thesis is the use of what I call quantitative narrative analysis, Q&A. Narrative details cataloged in spreadsheets dealing with settings, characters, actions, time, plot, stylistic features, and author-reader relationships. In particular, I will focus attention on time relationships known as anachronies within this brief opening scene of the Mark Passion narrative and note the trajectories and interactions they suggest. I will then draw conclusions about the overall plot of the Mark Passion narrative. Anachronies in Mark 14, 1 to 11. That's, that's the analepsis and prolepsis. They're both called anachronies. Anachronies are disjunctions between the chronological order of events in the story world, story time, and the order in which they are presented in the text, distorse time. In anachronies, events are not told in their chronological order, or they are retold at another time that they did not occur or will occur. Analepsies are the telling of events after they occur, prolepsies are the telling of events before they occur. Anachronies occur most often as narrator asides, filling in details, for example, the background story of the woman with the hemorrhage in Mark 5, or in speeches by characters talking about the past or future, for example, Jesus' eschatological discourse in Mark 13, big prolepsis. The analepsies of Mark 14, 1 to 11 appear in Table 1. That's down at the bottom of this, pa of this, <laughs> of this uh, paper. The prolepsies in Table 2. In this short passage, Mark 14, 1 to 11, there are a total of 21 anachronies, 8 analepsies and 13 prolepsies. Prolepsies appear in both the outer and inner story of the intercalation. Analepsies appear only in the inner story. These analepsies stand in contrast with a number of the prolepsies of the inner story, suggesting another trajectory for the woman's actions, as we will see. The prolepsies of 14.1-2 and 14.10-11 are part of the outer story of the intercalation. The prolepsies of 14.5-9 are part of the inner story, whereas this intercalation sets in contrast the actions of Judas and the woman who anointed Jesus, we will take special note of the way in which these prolepsies compare and contrast with one another, noting also the way in which the analepsies in the inner story compare and contrast with the prolepsies of both inner and outer story. I know this is kind of technical and it sounds, can sound confusing. The outer story. So this is the arresting of Jesus and the riot and the betraying of Jesus. In the outer story, seven of the 15 prolepsies occur. The first is a narrator aside setting the stage for the Mark Passion narrative with a reference to the Passover and the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Within the chronology of the Gospel of Mark with the Passover feast, Nisan 15, beginning after sunset on a Thursday, this reference to after two days suggests that the meeting of the religious leaders occurred on either Tuesday or Wednesday of Passion Week. The next three prolepsies all deal with the priests and scribes laying their plot to seize Jesus and kill him but with the caveat that they want to avoid doing this, quote, in the feast because of the risk of a riot by the people. In the feast here could be a temporal marker, you know, not during the feast, or actually a spatial marker at the feast, you know, like in the temple court. That is the location where the festivities take place. If it is a temporal marker, it indicates that the leaders were laying a plan to wait to arrest Jesus until after the Passover and perhaps until after the Feast of Unleavened Bread was completed. But if the in the feast is a spatial marker, as I think it is, it indicates that they were looking for the soonest time to arrest Jesus just away from the crowds. The leaders express worry about the crowds rioting if they arrest Jesus in the open. Consequently, a spatial marker may be in view. We can already see the clear trajectory of this side of the plot of the Mark and Passion narrative. Jesus will be arrested tried is not described here, Jesus will be arrested and killed. All the rest is planning. But what is missing in the leader's plan in verses 1 and 2 is a means to arrest Jesus secretly. Their fear of a riot by the people stands as a roadblock, a complication in narrative terms. Just how this gap will be resolved will not become clear until the conclusion of the outer story in verses 10 and 11. It turns out that the trajectory they fear of a riot will not materialize because their need for secrecy will be filled, filled by a most unexpected ally, Judas. 
The other three prolepsies of the outer story occur in verses 10 to 11, where, when Judas, one of the twelve, surprisingly decides to go to the religious leaders with an offer to betray Jesus into their hands. The three prolepsies come in quick steps, a narrator aside explaining why Judas went to the religious leaders in order to hand over Jesus, the priest's offer of money, not any set sum here in Mark, in contrast to the more than 300 denarii value of the nard in the inner story, and Judas looking for a good opportunity to hand Jesus over. The prolepsies of the outer story fit appropriately with the plot of the story. The religious leaders have a problem. They want to do away with Jesus, but the question is how to do so. They argue that any seizure of this popular prophet must be done, must not be done in public, since it would lead to a riot of the crowd and likely the foiling of their strategy. Thus, open seizure is a complication for their plan. Judas resolves that complication by offering to betray Jesus, to which the leaders gladly consent with the offer of money. Judas then starts looking for a good opportunity to betray his master. The plot has a cloak and daggers feel to it and does not bode well for Jesus. Thus, what looks good to the leaders, what will accomplish their goal, looks terribly tragic for Jesus, the hero of the Gospel of Mark. The matter of the foil complication, the riot that did not occur, also plays an interesting role in the dramatized irony between the two stories, as we will see below. The inner story, anointing Jesus, care for the poor, burial, and preaching the gospel. The inner story of the intercalation stands in marked contrast to the outer story. Instead of a death plot, it is a meal among friends with the most surprising action that everyone in the story talks about. Jesus is at the house of Simon the leper eating a meal. Simon has most likely gotten well from his skin ailment, probably healed by Jesus himself, though this is not narrated. What dominates the story instead of Simon's gratitude and hospitality is the action of an unnamed woman who comes with an alabaster container of perfume made from nard, which is called very expensive. She breaks the alabaster jar and pours the contents over Jesus' head. Nard was made from the root of a plant that grows in Nepal in India. Thus, the long distance to bring such a perfume would make it extremely costly. And it's about a year's worth of salary. 300 denarius was the usual wage for a day laborer. So this is like, a, this is like if you were you know, a day laborer and you were making $30,000 a year, you spend it on one party, a big cake. <laughs> I mean, this is like, this is like uh, unbelievable. She breaks the alabaster jar, pours the, pours the contents over Jesus' head. All right, all right, so then the woman never speaks in the story, never explains her action. Instead, those sitting at the table take umbrage at her deed, suggesting a different use for the nard. But Jesus comes to the woman's defense and explains the meaning of her action. All of the analepsies appear in this inner story of the intercalation and center on the woman's action. The analepsies in verses 4 and 5 are the some at the table who rebuke her extravagance. They insist that the nard was wasted and would have been better sold and the money given to the poor. Note that as in the outer story, an action, or in this case a series of actions, are proposed that in actuality never take place. She never sold it and gave the money to the poor. All right? In the outer story, the religious leaders feared a possible right of the people in favor of Jesus. In the inner story, the sale of the nard and the giving of the proceeds to the poor also does not take place. In each story, the unfulfilled action had to do with the valuation of Jesus though going in opposite directions. In the outer story, a riot of the people would have been in favor of Jesus and contra the plan to kill him. In the inner story, the sale of the nard with the money going to the poor would have devalued Jesus since he would not have been the recipient of the gift. The analepsies in 14, 6 to 9 provide Jesus' valuation of the woman's action and his interpretation of its meaning. He first affirms her action as good. He then explicates this approbation by indicating that she did what she had. That is, she used all that was in her possession to honor Jesus. Two of the analepsies in 14.8 contain a proleptic characteristic. While Jesus is describing the woman's action, she came beforehand, linked with to anoint. He reinterprets the meaning of her action as foreshadowing her, his burial. He thus, from his perspective, makes her action indicative of the trajectory of his story in the Mark Passion narrative. His viewpoint is only enhanced when we turn to the prolepsies. The six prolepsies of the inner story all revolve around the significance of the woman's action. Jesus responds to the some who have criticized her. They give the excuse of using the value of the perfume for a mission to the poor. Jesus unmasks this mistaken valuation, comparing himself and the poor in a temporal hierarchy. 
These complainers have the poor with them all the time and can help them whenever they wish. But Jesus notes they do not always have him. Jesus' statements, while focusing on the woman's actions, say much about himself. He protects and honors the woman because she has honored him to a level that no one else has at this meal. He notes that he will not always be with them. This prefiguration of his death parallels the prolapses of 14.1-2 in which the religious leaders lay their plot to arrest and kill Jesus. But Jesus raises up the woman's action with even more specificity concerning himself by indicating in the two interconnected analepsies of 14.8 that what she has done is to anoint his body in advance for burial. He then goes on to indicate in true prolapses in 14.9 uh, that wherever the gospel is proclaimed in the whole world, what she has done will be told in memory of her. These two verses, verses 8 and 9, hold the key to the meaning of the intercalation as a whole. Jesus both explains the woman's action as a highly honorable burial rite and then forecasts its repetition in gospel preaching throughout the world. Jesus' words stand in antithetical parallelism with the religious leader's plot to kill Jesus and Judas' forthcoming betrayal. The woman honors Jesus, the leaders along with Judas plan to shame him in rejection and execution, and there was no more dishonorable death than the cross. These two intertwined trajectories of honor and shame move to the same result, a crucified Jesus buried in a tomb. But Jesus does not end there. He projects the retelling of the woman's action in gospel preaching throughout the world. The two prolepsies of 14.9 that express this idea are external to the Gospel of Mark, projected by Jesus, but never narrated in the text, assuming the likely ending of Mark in Mark 16.8. One might wonder, given the Passion predictions of Mark 8.31, 9.31, and 10.33 to 34, why Jesus does not make reference in this intercalation to his resurrection. But his resurrection is the action of God, whereas what is described in 14.1 to 11 is altogether the action of people in relation to Jesus. That is the point. The great chasm is over how different groups relate to him, treat him in either honor or shame. The woman is the only one in this passage to honor him. The sum in the inner story plays a higher valuation on the poor than on Jesus. Notice how they said that the nard was wasted. It was wasted on Jesus. This, quote, low Christology parallels that of the religious leaders and Judas in the outer story, such a low Christology, in fact, that they planned to bring an end to his life. We are now prepared to see the outworking of these trajectories in the rest of the Mark and Passion narrative. Two ironic trajectories intertwine. To be clear, on the one hand, the trajectory of the religious leaders and Judas, and in a more muted way, that of the sum in the inner story, is a trajectory of dishonor and death. It presupposes that Jesus is not the Messiah, and that as a pretender to this moniker, he deserves shame and execution. The trajectory of the woman's story, on the other hand, is one of honoring Jesus, unappreciated by others around her, but recognized by Jesus as the highest honor, one deserving repetition throughout the world in gospel proclamation. The ironic contrast between the two trajectories is nicely caught in the play on, word, on the word good. The woman's good deed, doing good to the poor whenever you wish, the preaching of the good news, and the nefarious Judas looking for a good opportunity to betray Jesus. The woman's act is good and part of the good news, while Judas, the betrayer, looks for a good opportunity to betray Jesus. Within the Mark Passion narrative, it is not difficult to see the outworking of the first trajectory. Jesus will be arrested, tried, and crucified. He will be abused and mocked by the religious leaders, the Roman soldiers, those passing by the cross, and even by those crucified with him. He will die in a state of dereliction and be buried in a borrowed tomb. But where does the other trajectory appear? And how does this terrible scene of ignominious execution become good news? Four characteristics of the Mark Passion narrative illustrate well the way in which an underlying gospel conception actually controls the narrative and changes tragedy into good news. First, the scene of the Last Supper contains the institution of the Eucharist or the Lord's Supper in which Jesus speaks of his blood of the covenant which is poured out for many. These words echo Mark 10 verse 45 where Jesus speaks of his mission of service and that he will give his life as a ransom for many. The substitutionary language is unmistakable. Jesus sees his death as a means of establishing a covenant bond with his followers and ransoming their lives. That is good news. Second, the will of God comes to fulfillment in the death of Jesus. 
the scene in Gethsemane clearly portrays this divine plan as Jesus accepts the cup of suffering. Where James and John are told, uh, are, are told they too will, uh, oh, I'm sorry, that's good. Okay, let me start that sentence again. The scene in Gethsemane clearly portrays this divine plan as Jesus accepts the cup of suffering, same one James and John will drink later. The cup, the, the will of God, the cup, must of necessity be part of the good news. This plan of God is also portrayed in more muted yet nonetheless visible format in the scene of the cross where a striking parallel to the baptismal scene occurs as illustrated in Table 3. When this gets published, you can read that. All of these parallels suggest that as the will of God comes to fulfillment at the baptism with his words of affirmation for Jesus from heaven, so the cross fulfills his plan as well. As the one scene portrays the inauguration of Jesus' ministry, that's his baptism, so the other depicts its culmination. Third, the Christological titles so sparsely on display in most of Mark. Mark does not use the word Lord or Christ very often at all, actually. Um, the Christological titles, so sparsely on display in most of Mark, pile up in the Mark Passion narrative, particularly in the scene of the cross. In the trial before the Sanhedrin, it is Jesus' clear claim to be the Messiah and his projection of himself seated royally at the right hand of God that brings the call of blasphemy and condemnation. Before Pilate, he accepts the title King of the Jews and is mocked as such by the soldiers. The inscription of the charge against him placed on the cross is King of the Jews. And the religious leaders call on him to save himself as the Christ, the King of Israel. Finally, the centurion calls him Son of God. Except for the last of these attributions, all are said in mockery. However, from the narrator's viewpoint, it is clear from the beginning of the book that they are all true. Consequently, the irony of the enemies of Jesus using these titles is that they are giving voice to the narrator's, narrator's affirmation of who Jesus is. He is the king of the Jews. Fourth, the death and burial of Jesus, the conclusion of the, tra the trajectory laid out in 14, 1 to 2 and 10 to 11, is not the end of the Gospel of Mark. The resurrection of Jesus is a reversal of the trajectory his enemies planned and the initiation of the trajectory he laid out in 14.9. It fills the gap of how the good news can contain a burial scene. The woman's honor of Jesus becomes the vehicle whereby an overarching trajectory of honor, joy, and good news overtakes one of death and dishonor. Conclusion. We return to the original thesis that the trajectories set within these two stories, one ending in death, the other extending outward in gospel proclamation, work together to express the overarching thesis of the Mark Passion narrative that what appears to be an incredible tragedy, the crucifixion of Jesus, is in reality the best news the world has ever experienced. The narrator presents the Mark Passion narrative in a spare style that simply places on display the trajectory planned by men versus the trajectory planned by God. Men plot and carry out the death of an innocent man. God acts at the same time to present his son as the ransom for many. For the evangelist, the conniving of men cannot prevail against the will of God. The recognition of the intertwined trajectories of Mark 14, 1 to 11, along with their display throughout the rest of the Mark Passion narrative, has significant implications for the overall interpretation of the Gospel of Mark, particularly its soteriology, and deserve thoughtful attention for further research. Thank you very much. All right, I've got a, a roaming microphone, so I want you to be thinking about questions so we can have a little bit of opportunity to, to dialogue with uh, Dr. Shepard. Uh, but before we do that, we've got uh, an opportunity to help support the Southwestern chapter of the Adventist Theological Society. Now, sometimes there are just amazing opportunities when we have a great faculty who are related to other uh, distinguished scholars at other institutions who are visiting. Uh, but our, our next two speakers actually are gonna have to travel, including our next speaker where we're paying for his plane ticket, and that's been made possible by previous donations. And so this is an, an organization, the Adventist Theological Society, that helps to support scholarship, both internationally and with this chapter here that we have in this particular area. We want to help promote great scholarship and create future 
opportunities like this. So if, if you have been blessed and appreciate that and want to help support continued activities, uh, your generosity helps to make that possible. So I've asked Malachi, who is the grandson of our speaker here today, he has generously volunteered to, uh, to he'll be passing around the offering plate, and if, uh, uh, as you are moved, we appreciate uh, your support and contribution. So I'll be just going around, so just raise your hand, and I'll come to you with the microphone so that everyone else can hear you. We'd like, a, it's a great opportunity for, for dialogue. Elizabeth? This is so fascinating. Thank you so much. It's very helpful. I wonder, um, to what extent do you think that the author was consciously applying these structural um, concepts and ideas as he was putting the story together? Okay. Very good question. Uh, I'll just repeat the question a little bit. So um, her question is, uh, was, was the uh, evangelist, Mark, when he was writing this, was he, was he consciously doing this? Um, my answer to that question is yes. And the reason I say that is when I, when I was working on my dissertation, um, the sandwich stories in Mark, when I studied the Gospel of Mark, it was like, you know, uh, when I first took a class in it, I'd never noticed this before. And the professor said, these are sandwich stories. I said, sandwich stories, what's that? And he explained what a sandwich story was, and I said, well, what do they mean? He said, well, they say that the two stories uh, interpret one another. And I was, okay, so what's that mean? So when I came to my dissertation, um, I, I decided I would study these, and I chose six passages that almost everybody agreed were uh, Mark and Sandwich stories. And then I took and applied this methodology, uh, characterized characters and actions and everything, and then I looked for patterns. And what I found was that they had the same thing happening every time. So if it happens, you know, it keeps happening every time, you say, that seems to be intentional. And so that's what led me to say, oh, this, this was an intentional thing. And then, so what was he trying to do? And then I found out that there were always these contrasting things. I mean, if you, you want to go read my dissertation, you'll see that in all six of these, there's these kind of contrasting, contrasting, contrasting things that were going on. And I finally came to the conclusion that that was uh, ironic, uh, irony that was being described. And uh, it happens in all six. So. If it happens six times like that, then you, I mean, it happens once, you say, oh, that could just be a lark. You know, that could just be, you know, something. But if it happens all the time, yeah. Okay. Any other questions? Either I put, either I put you to sleep or it was just like <laughs> too much. that you were challenged on a particular point. I was two points that I was challenged oh, on two. a particular. I, have, I, find, oh, I tell my students when I, when I go to professional meetings, I want people to tell me what's wrong with my paper. Uh, not because I'm a, a masochist and, and want to be you know, beaten, <laughs> but because I want to know when somebody sees something wrong with it, um, then I'll go home and fix it, make it better. I've already started to improve this paper because of what he said. The two things he challenged me on, um, one was, he doesn't think, uh, and this is a, an, an, I've written a commentary, the new SDA Bible commentary on the Gospel of Mark, um, right now in the revision stage. I don't know if you know that there's a new SDA Bible commentary coming out. It's really been a project we've been working on, a group of us, for about, it's getting close to 10 years now. And uh, there'll be some things coming out at general conference time, probably not my commentary, but some others. And um, he challenged me on the, he, he wrote a commentary on Mark that's been published, and he challenged me on the idea that, that this was a royal anointing of Jesus. He, he felt that it was just a, uh, for burial, that he was being anointed for burial. Um, that was one of the things that he challenged me on, and he almost persuaded me on that one. I, I said to him at the meeting, I said, almost thou persuadest me. Uh, <laughs> The other one I think he was mistaken on was uh, th there's, a, there's a verse in there that's very difficult to translate. It's verse uh, six. You read it in English, it just seems really smooth. But um, and it, in Greek, if you, if you put, it, put it more literally, it's she, she did what she had. And you're like, what in the world does that mean? She did what, usually, usually it's translated she, she, um, 
what is it? She, she did what she could, which is actually probably not a great way to put it across because it sounds like she couldn't do much, but she did what she could. I mean, when you, when you 300 denarii, more than 300 denarii, that, that's a little bit more than what she did what, you know, what she could. It wasn't much, but she did what she could. Um, his take on this was a special meaning of uh, this word have in the particular way it's written in Greek, that she understood who he was and that therefore she, uh, she saw in him what nobody else saw and that's why she anointed him with this. Yeah. And uh, I still disagree with him actually, but his, his um, not that that's a bad point, but um, I'm not sure that that's exactly what's going on there. I, I, it made me go back and look things over then again. So I went back and studied all the uses of the word have in the Gospel of Mark and all the uses of the word did in the Gospel of Mark. And what's interesting is in that in the verses just before this, Jesus says, you always have the poor with you and whenever you want, you can do good for them. Then he says, she did what she had. Um, you can put that across a little bit by saying, she did what she had. No, or she, she did what she had. In other words, she honored me and you did not. And I think that's probably more in its context what's going on than what my colleague thought. But that was his two critiques. So, yeah, there's a question over here. Um, to oh. go with his idea that she recognized something in him that the others didn't, is that what you said his yeah, argument was? Yeah, that's what my friend that? said, that, that, that she was cognizant, somehow she was cognizant of, of who Jesus was where the rest of the people you know, didn't, didn't really get it. And she saw him in a special way. Did he elaborate on what that was? Did he give it a name? Well, he doesn't, he doesn't take this as, he, she recognized him as the Messiah, um, but it, he, he doesn't take it as a royal anointing. Yeah, that would seem to almost contradict his former point. Well, there's, you, you, you could say, maybe that'll give me some ammo to shoot at him. Because, um, hey, he's, he's really special, like a Messiah King, but it wasn't a royal anointing. But. It wasn't, yeah, the problem is that he pointed out in, de in detail, he's, he's a very detailed kind of a guy. He's a good friend. Uh, Jim Vells is his name, and he's a Lutheran uh, fellow. And um, he, he pointed out that it never says royal anointing in there, and that usually kings were anointed with olive oil. And uh, that actually made me look at the, a parallel story to this in the Gospel of Luke, where Jesus is anointed in a Simon's house. It's in a different location, it seems. And um, Jesus says to Simon, when I came into your house, you did not anoint my head with oil, but she has anointed my feet with perfume. And so I said, well, now that's interesting. Jesus parallels oil and perfume in that. The other thing that's very interesting is that in this story in Mark, she anoints his head. And that would be the place where kings would be anointed, would be on their head. Um, I, I think it might be both that's being described here, both a royal, a royal aspect and a burial. You know, he, he does say, she's anointed me beforehand for burial. Uh, but it's kind of a, you might say, a royal burial anointing. It's very expensive. It's not cheap. Yes. Uh, Dr. Sharpen, thank you very much for the presentation. And uh, correct me if I'm mistaken. Uh, do you think that Jesus here is breaking like a paradigm, like a cultural paradigm? Because to be anointed as a king or in any other occasion, it should be done by a man, not by a woman. But here you see a woman doing that. So in, the, in a Jewish culture, that was not acceptable. And I don't know in the Gre Greco-Roman world, prob probably, but in a Jewish, never. So, but Jesus is doing, accepting. Not only accepting, but even putting her in a very special uh, level in the society. Okay, that's a very interesting comment uh, and, and observation. Um, Jesus, in the Gospels does do things that are out of ordinary and out of, that break out of cultural norms. 
Um, I'd have to look into that more in terms of, uh, you know, just wh where do where do women fit in in relationship to men and questions of anointing. Uh, you do have, you do notice in, in all of the Gospels, it's the women who are coming to the tomb to anoint Jesus. Not only the women, though, because in, in, uh, in John you have Nicodemus and Joseph of Arimathea coming with, uh, you know, uh, burial rite type of things. Um, yeah, it's an interesting question. There were festival yeah. anointings that people would, you know, olive oil was used, like it says in Luke 8. Olive oil was used at, uh, regularly, and there would be a festival anointing. One of, one of the things that I find striking about this story, uh, this nard, uh, I mean, this was really expensive perfume, and um, likely, not unlikely, uh, the smell of nard was on Jesus all the way to the cross. You know, and, and people would, I mean, he'd be brought into the judgment hall, people like, what is that? Nard, that's nard. You know, you kind of wonder. I mean, it's never narrated that way in the gospel stories, but <laughs> I, I've thought about this, you know, this whole, whole thing of the nard is really interesting. Yeah. Now, growing up in your household, I've known about sandwich stories for a while, but I've always thought of them as interpreting each other, and so I've always looked at them in kind of a separate way, like these two stories connect with each other, and I haven't ever noticed this idea that they then lead into further themes throughout the book. Are there other examples of sandwich stories in the book of Mark which point towards themes or point towards future things in the book? Oh, that's a nice question, too. Uh, there are, actually. Now, the six sandwich stories that I, that I studied were the first one is in chapter three. It's the story of Jesus' relatives going out to take charge of him because they think he's crazy. And that's the outer story. And the inner story is the religious leaders saying he's got the devil in him and that's why he can cast out demons. All right. Um, that one has a lot to say about Christology and who Jesus' family is. The story of the woman with the hemorrhage, uh, I'm sorry, Jairus' daughter and the woman with the hemorrhage is in chapter five. And that one, again, is about Christology, about this Messiah who does the strangest things, almost like a clown. He asks, you know, who touched my clothes? And, you know, she's not dead, she's just asleep, and things like that. That's about Christology. In chapter 6 is where we start to get one that really has a forecast because it's the story of the disciples going out and um, preaching the gospel, and the inner story is John the Baptist being put to death. Now, John the Baptist is the forerunner of Jesus, and even his death is like a forecast of Jesus' death. So it does point forward. When you get over to chapter 11, you have this uh, story of the cursing of the fig tree, which is always very, you know, people are like, what is going on? And that surrounds the, the cleansing of the temple. Now, that one is very strongly related to where things are headed because... What happens is Jesus cleanses the temple, and that's what actually leads to them planning his death. And the irony is that they're going to kill him, and that's going to bring the end of the temple. The temple's going to be destroyed. Then you get this story here that now forecasts without, throughout the rest of the Passion narrative. And the last one is the most striking of the sandwich stories, and that's the uh, Peter following Jesus into the judgment hall or into the courtyard of the high priest and Jesus' trial. And Jesus' trial, you know, he says he's the Messiah, and that's when they say, you know, they're going to kill him. And on the outer story, Peter is, uh, this is when Peter denies Jesus. And the, the fascinating thing is that Jesus had foretold this is what would happen. So at the very end of the inner story, they, they, they blindfold Jesus and they hit him. And they say, prophecy, prophesy. And it's at that very moment that his prophecy that Peter would deny him hmm. is coming to pass. So Peter denying Jesus proves that Jesus is the Messiah. It's like, woo, you know, wow. it's clash. So, yeah, there, there, there are these aspects. I don't know that it happens every time, but there are, especially as you get further into the book. Question back there. Yeah, um, I've, I've heard that, uh, and I wonder what Mark scholars think of this and what you think of it in particular, that is, I, I've heard that 
Mark's gospel is largely Peter's gospel because Mark and Peter spent some time together and it's thought that they, uh, Peter related a lot of these stories to, to Mark and he wrote it down. Uh, so that's one question. The other question is, if, if that's true, would Peter have told these sandwich stories, do you mm -hmm. think? Mm -hmm. Well, that's a great question too. Um, <laughs> the tradition of the, of the early Christian church is that Mark's gospel, in fact, is a telling of, of Peter's stories. Um, and that um, tradition, uh, we also have in the, in the book of, uh, of First Peter, he makes reference to Mark, calls him my son, and um, so there, there seems to be some kind of tie to him. Now, the actual stories of the Gospel of Mark, interestingly enough, um, don't have as close a tie to the writings of First and Second Peter as does, for instance, the Gospel of John. And actually, the Gospel of Matthew, Peter has a more prominent role than he does in the Gospel of Mark. So, does it or doesn't it? I don't. I don't know. We don't. We don't have the name. The evangelist never names himself. He just says, "Hello, I'm Mark." You know, the only way that we know that this is Mark's gospel is that it, in all the manuscripts that have the beginning of the gospel, it will say, "According to Mark." That's the usual title. According to Mark, kata markon, not the gospel according to Mark, but just kata markon. Now, I often talk to my students about this, and sometimes I put it on a test, and I ask them, how many Gospels are there? It's a trick question. Do you know the answer? There's one. It's the Gospel, according to Matthew. The Gospel, according to Mark. The Gospel, so there's only one Gospel. But it's according to these, it's told by these different people. So, um, let's see, what was your other question? Ah, yes, what Peter told the sandwich stories. Well, um, it, it, it's kind of interesting to compare the sandwich stories that appear more in Mark than anywhere else. A few show up in Matthew, a few show up in Luke, but not in the same way or not in, to the same extent with the same kind of narrative goal as they do in the Gospel of, uh, of Mark. So if this is Peter's Gospel, yeah, then you might say that. But the trouble is, we don't have any gospel according to Peter. Uh, what we do have is his first two books, and by the way, I teach those as well, and those, those are great books. Especially, the theology of First Peter is highly uh, undervalued by many people, but the theology of First Peter is every bit as profound as the theology of the Apostle Paul. Very, very striking stuff, yeah. Yes? Uh, just a quick comment and then a question on the Dr. Acevedo's comment about... I'm getting water. Okay. <laughs> um, about the role of women in the pagan Greco-Roman world. Yes. Um, in ancient Rome, at least, um, there are accounts that when C certain Caesars were, uh, took, c did come to power, they would first have to <coughs> go to the Vestal Temple where they would be anointed by the Vestal Virgins, usually the high priestess of them. Mm. Um, so women did play a particular role, especially in paganism. The, f the feminine was a huge thing. Yeah. Um, and, and, so so and the I Jews will, probably were aware of this, which would have made it even more so. Um, I, will, I will add to that that um, the role of women is sometimes in the ancient world are seen as like nobodies or something. But actually, a number of women became patron, patrons. Mm -hmm. I suppose we might say matrons. Uh, they became, um, it, like their husband died, and they, they became possessors of wealth. And yep. then they would, they would support things. And we have record of this in Luke, that yep. there's these wealthy women who supported Jesus' ministry. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, along those same, uh, those same kind of lines. So I appreciate the uh, reference to the Vestal Virgins. Yeah, so, it, yeah, uh, it just made me strike back to that, because it's almost the same. Caesar would actually kneel before them, hmm. and they would pour... Um, certain accounts say a mixture of oil and fragrances together um, oh. and things like that. I think in one account it was honey. I wouldn't mind the reference to that. That would, that so, would be useful. Yeah, I, I'd have to go and find it among all the books. But I'll give you my the, card. You can send me the... Okay. The, the, question, the question I have is, um, in one of your slides you said that Jesus was king at the cross. And I, I'm not a theologian, so I'm just curious why Jesus is king at the cross. 
and not after the resurrection when he ascends back to God. Oh, because well, at the cross, it's my understanding, you know, he bears the sin yes. of the world at the cross, and I, and I don't understand how he became king at the cross then. Ah, okay, that's a good question. Um, what I'm referring to there is all of the Christological titles that appear in this scene. Now, as I mentioned, uh, if, if you go look for the word Christ or Messiah and the word Lord um, in the Gospel of Mark, you will be surprised that I think the word Christ only appears seven times in the whole book and the word Lord, something about the same. Very, very rarely do they appear. And yet, almost all these terms are piled up by numerous people mocking him and everything. They all show up at the cross. And of course, this uh, placard above his head is the reason he's being crucified, the king of the Jews. Mm. Now, our, our evangelist, um, and, and this is true of like all the evangelists, have a very strong sense of irony. Uh, they are Christians, of course, and they're talking and they say, look, king of the Jews, isn't it true? You know, now, of course, that's the, that's the concept of irony is that one person means it one way and the other people are, are talking about it the other way. So in the evangelist's plot, right, this whole king of the Jews uh, kind of terminology, he's the Christ, let him come down from the cross type of a thing. Uh, they're all mocking him, but for the evangelists, it's all very true. So, um, and the evangelist gets you going with that from the very beginning of the book. Um, he says, the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Now, right there, he's used those phrases, Messiah and Son of God. Okay? He's used those at the very beginning of the book. And you, as the reader, know, you know this from the get-go. You know the first person who's not possessed by demons, the first person to say that in the book is Peter in the very middle of the book, Mark 8, 27 to 30, okay? So he says, you know, what do, who do men say that I am? Who do you say that I am? You're the Messiah. He's the first person who's not possessed by a demon who makes that, that confession. Well, you knew it all the way from the beginning. So from the beginning of the book, we call this a narrative, we call this reader elevating. You're standing up there, you're looking down at the disciples, hey, come on, can't you guys see that? You know, don't, oh, yeah. you know it, I, I don't know if you've ever, it, it, it's, like, it's like watching a, 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 a movie that's like a, like a horror movie, you know? And they're, they're, always going, they're always going towards some door, right? And then you hear this music. Da, 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 da. You say, don't open that door, can't you hear that music? They can't hear the music. See, that's reader elevating. You're, you're up above and in the Gospel of Mark, now here I'm, I'm going to give you the, like this punchline of the Gospel of Mark. You're like, ha, 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 you guys don't get it. I understand, you guys don't get it. And the Gospel of Mark does a reversal at the very end of the book. Because at the end of the book, the, the Gospel of Mark ends in Mark 16, 8. And uh, you know, we could talk another time about <laughs> why it's there and not verse 20. But it ends in 16, 8, and it goes like this. Um, and the, the women were, were seized by fear and trembling, and they ran away, and they didn't say anything to anybody because they were afraid. And you're thinking like, wait a minute. That's no way to end a gospel. You, you can't end a story like that. <laughs> right? I don't know if you've, you've got little kids, and they have the same, they bring you the same book every night that they want you to read, right? So you're reading the book. I've done this. You know, you're reading the book, and if you happen to turn two pages instead of one, what will the child do? <laughs> They'll turn the paper back. They, you didn't read this page, Daddy. Right? And you read it, and if you come to the end of the story and you change the ending, the child will say to you, no, Daddy, that, that's not how the story ends, Daddy. <laughs> that's not how the story ends. See, um, this is what Mark is doing to you. You at the reader thought, ah, ha, ha, I'm up above and I understand everything. And then he... He punches you at the very end because that's no way to end a gospel story. It would be like going to a symphony. You guys have a symphony orchestra here, or like you have the big band and everything. And if they, you know, you've listened to those Beethoven things, you know, you could tell like they're coming to the end of it. You can, you know, they're coming to the end for a whole minute. Da 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 da. What if they stop there? 
Well, somebody in the back of the uh, thing would stand up, da. You know, the, you, 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 you have to have that ending note. So the Gospel of Mark ends with that unfinished symphony. And it's like, well, somebody's got to tell the story. Who's that? You. You. If the women didn't talk, you must go and tell. See? And so he, he, he catches you because you think you understand everything. And he's like, okay, so if you get it, why aren't you out telling it? See? Okay, was there another question here? Yeah, I have one more. I've actually been reading the Gospel of Mark myself, and what I've been noticing lately is a lot of um, demons and demon-possessed people saying, you're the Christ, and him saying, you be quiet, don't say that, and he's casting the demons out to get him to shut up. And when I saw your title, I couldn't help but wonder if that's, a, if that's what you were going to talk about. So do you see that as a parallel to what you're talking about, or oh, is yeah. that a separate literary you know, thing going on there? Well, it's, it's intertwined with it. There's this thing called the secrecy motif that runs through the whole book of Mark. And um, I actually call it the revelation secrecy motif because it's not just secrecy, it's also revelation. And it's a little bit, you know, you forgive me, it's a little bit like Superman. You know, you, 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 you see Superman and he's, when he takes off the glasses, he's Superman, right? And if he puts the glasses back on, he's Clark Kent, right? And, you know, you're kind of like, they put on the glasses, and they say, where did Superman go? Where did, where, where did he go? You're like, he's right there, stupid. Just take off the glasses. You know, that's Superman. That's, can't you see that Clark Kent and Superman are the same guy? I mean, really? Is it that hard to recognize this person? All right, so, you know, I mean, that's sort of the under, some of the underlying things. So in the Gospel of Mark, there's a little bit of that going on. Jesus says, shh, shh, shh. Sh. I mean, he tells Jairus and his wife, don't tell anybody. Can you imagine doing that? The, the little girl has come back to life. Everybody was weeping. Everybody was playing the flute, right? She runs out of the room to go play with her friends. The parents walk out and say, oh, what, what has happened? Oh, well, she's gone to play with her friends. Yes, but she was dead. What happened? Well, I, 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 well, we're happy she's doing well. You know, I mean, how are you going to deny what, uh, what is there? So there's this revelation and secrecy thing, and it's, it's, there's a tension to it, but it's, it's a... It's a secret that cannot be hidden. See, it's a secret that cannot be hidden. And that's why the story ends with the secrecy, because then it's the punch. It cannot be hidden. You're the disciple. Go tell the good news. Well, the, the ones who, who, who tell this are the demons, all right? And uh, demons are no match for Jesus. I guess we'll end it there. Thank you very much. Would you please join me in thanking Dr. Shepard for his presentation? Thank you. You see up on the screen, I just want to briefly remind you, uh, if you go right back to that first slide, Malachi, um, the Amethyst Theological Society, it's an international society. You can join easily. Just go online. Uh, when you become a member, you can have the option to receive either the scholarly journal or the perspective digest. And again, it's a great way to stay connected. Just turn my, 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 turn my thing back on. Oh, I'll use this. Okay. Um, you can go to the website and actually you can see and access all of the journal articles, except for the last journal, um, of, of the scholarly and of these popular uh, versions. And there are numerous, numerous valuable articles produced by our scholars that are very helpful on, on many church topics. Uh, this is a great resource. And uh, please become a member of the Adventist Theological Society. It's a, a good thing. And I, I want to say, as one of the past presidents, I'm, I really appreciate what Michael's doing with uh, uh, Peter and Amy and other people here of uh, promoting an ATS, a very active ATS chapter here in, in Keene. You're blessed to have this. And uh, so uh, we appreciate your support of the society. The society does things all around the world. And uh, we're planning things all the time, and people are going all over the place to to uh, present good material for our churches. Well, there you heard it from one of our uh, ATS past presidents, and so I just want to again encourage you. It's not very difficult; doesn't cost very much. Great uh, resources, both online as well as by becoming a member. Our next two presentations. If you go to the next one, Malachi, January 18th, Sabbath afternoon, same time, same place, right here. Uh, we will have Jonathan Gardner, who uh, is an alumnus of Southern Adventist University, did theology and archaeology, I believe, 
went on to do his master's at Wheaton in Old Testament, and is now doing his PhD in Old Testament and archeology span at Trinity. So this is some of his ongoing research. So I kind of talked with him about some of the things. He's very active going every summer uh, with a number of different archeological digs. You'll notice something with our, our ATS chapter presentations we've had through the year. We've tried to have some variety. So something more historical, uh, we've had, uh, well, today something more in the New Testament. This will be more Old Testament focused. Uh, so we've tried to look for a range of topics related to, obviously, uh, scripture and affirming scripture. So uh, you'll, you'll see this is one of our next presentations coming up uh, titled, well, I don't remember the title, whatever was on the screen, Deus Fult, um, How Assyrian Theology Justified Cruelty. So kind of some cutting edge research that's uh, uh, that people are doing. Go ahead to the next one, Malachi. February 22, we have Lael Caesar, again, a longtime professor of theology and ethics at Andrews University. Most recently, he's been uh, at the Adventist Review Ministries, you know, Adventist Review, Adventist World that you get in the mail, and he will be here on our campus for our February uh, presentation, As Vile as Rape, Ugly Theology in the Book of Job. He'll actually be speaking for our Vespers while he's here, and one of his big passions is, is confronting uh, depictions of, of uh, how people view God and trying to go back again and, and uh, tackle that, that theological um, issue. So some great presenters coming up around the corner. Once again, um, I want to thank you for coming, but let's go ahead and why don't we stand for a closing word of prayer. Loving Father in heaven, we thank you for this uh, presentation this afternoon that we can go back to scripture. Thank you for Dr. Shepard and his research. We just pray that you continue to bless him and all of us as we seek to better understand your word and as we uh, have learned about these sandwich stories, ultimately this amazing uh, narrative of your life here on earth that culminates in your death on the cross and we're so thankful and grateful for that and the very intricacies of scripture that once again affirm uh, how much you love each and every one of us so thank you for that and bless each and every one i pray in jesus holy name amen thank you once again uh, for coming out this afternoon and god bless